Hello there guys, it's me Unstable Voltage, and this is a little video where I'm going to talk a bit about the new upcoming expansion DLC for Europa Universalis 4, Mori Nostrum. Now, it's been announced for a couple of weeks now. I'd like to say that it's a while out before we actually see this expansion, but given the rate that Paradox normally put out the expansions for this game, I wouldn't be surprised if we end up seeing it in a few weeks to a month's time. It doesn't seem like five minutes since the Cossacks came out, but Mare Nostrum is probably just around the corner. Now, I'm going to qualify this video by just saying you're not going to see any gameplay in this video, nothing from Mare Nostrum. I don't have access to the build that they're currently using. I'm, I very much doubt anyone outside of Paradox does because it's still very much in the experimental phase where they're messing around with different mechanics and trying different things out. There's probably a, a privileged few outside of the company who will get access to early builds, but I will not be one of them. That said, when I do get my copy of Mare Nostrum, I will be going through and making some more videos. One, two more accurately detail some of the changes that they are making because what I'm going to be talking about in this video is probably likely to change before the actual expansion releases and also I'll need to update my tutorials as well because some of the things they are adding do make some significant changes to the game's core mechanics. So Mare Nostrum, it is the, it's Latin, it basically means our sea, which is what the Romans used to call the Mediterranean. So you'd be very much forgiven for thinking that Mare Nostrum was focused on the naval side of things. Well, it does certainly change some of the naval things, but it changes a lot of other stuff as well. First of all, let's go through the major thing with the navy. They are adding a new resource called sailors, which is essentially manpower for your navy so at the moment whenever you build ships or repair ships it just costs money now you're going to have sailors which act like manpower and you will require sailors to build and repair ships it's pretty much that simple they're also adding a few other options with the ships that will allow you to give better direction to them autonomously so at the moment you've got things like go home at war so when you go to war all of your ships automatically go and dock up if you've got Go Home at War enabled. Now, there are times when you don't necessarily want that to happen because sometimes you'll have some ships that are nowhere near the war. Sometimes you might be fighting against someone who's landlocked and doesn't have a navy, so there's absolutely no point for your ships to go home at war. So the idea is instead of you having to constantly micromanage all of your... Uh, fleets and babysit them you'll have more options to be able to tell them under what specific circumstances to go home and where to go and dock up and things like that now i haven't really seen a lot of that in action so i can't really go too much into detail with that but the options are going to be there so that is the sort of major change to the naval game i highly suspect that they will be giving some love to the the naval idea groups as well there's a couple there's um I think it's uh, naval ideas in the military idea group and maritime ideas in diplomatic, which most people tend not to use because they're not really all that good. So they'll probably give them some love and change them around. So there's a couple of other things that are worth uh, talking about as well. First of all, the map. There's a few changes being made to the map. Firstly, they are taking some of the larger provinces and chopping them down to make slightly smaller ones. One good example is Ireland. Ireland currently only has four provinces, uh, five provinces. In Moray Nostrum, I think there's about nine or ten provinces, so they've actually cut them down into smaller provinces, and also it starts off with more independent nations there as well. So it'll give you a little bit more to play with in Ireland. They're also doing a little bit of work over here in... Scandinavia and also in Eastern Europe, uh, Western Asia, where they're taking some of these larger provinces and actually cutting them down into smaller ones because there's quite a lot of provinces over here that are just really large, low development provinces. They're also adding one or two other uh, little countries in the mix as well and they are changing some of the culture groups around slightly. Now I don't know the culture groups well enough to know which changes they're making but they are changing some of the ones over here in Eastern Europe but yeah they're certainly making some of the provinces uh, a little bit smaller and chopping them up but 
one of the big changes they're making is actually to Africa. So what they're doing down here is, first of all, a lot of the provinces that are uncolonized at the start of the game are actually going to start off colonized. Madagascar, for one. Madagascar at the start of the game at the moment is three uncolonized provinces. In Mare Nostrum, the whole of Madagascar is going to be colonized, and I think there's, again, about five or six provinces on Madagascar itself. There will also be various other provinces added in into Africa, particularly southern and central Africa. Also, a lot of the larger nations like Mutapa and Congo will start off as smaller independent nations. So, there'll be less colonizing going on in Africa and more fighting to actually take the land that you want. And they're also adding a new religion to Africa as well. So, there will be fetishism for the new African nation. So, those are the main changes that they are going to be making to the map. Now, they're also adding another feature called Trade Leagues. Now, trade, trade Leagues are for Merchant Republics. And what they allow you to do is you can start a Trade League if you're a Merchant Republic, or you can join one. And there are some rules to it. The person who runs a Trade League can be any size they want, really, but over a certain size, they do get some sort of negative uh, penalties with the Trade League. If you want to join a Trade League, not as the leader, you have to be a one-province miner. Now, anyone who joins a Trade League is automatically in a defensive pact with the Trade League. So they basically come to each other's aid in defensive calls, but they don't actually count as a relationship. So if you are running a trade league and you have 10 different one province miners all as part of that trade league, they're not going to count as individual relationships, but they will all be called into defensive wars. So obviously they don't count as um, alliances because you can't call them into offensive wars. Now the, the purpose of having a trade league is anyone that's in a trade league actually transfers their power to the league's ruler. But it also increases the trade power in the trade node where the league is located. So they're still working on the numbers and trying to work out exactly how it's going to balance out. If you lose your prestige, it's possible that you can be voted out and someone else will be the ruler of that particular trade league. But the idea of this mechanic is mainly so that these little one province miners, these little merchant republics can actually sort of band together for a little bit of protection and also drastically increase the amount of money that they can make through trade. So that's what's happening with the trade leagues. But the three things that I really want to talk about, which are three of the biggest changes that they're going to be making um, in Mare Nostrum. So the first one is a idea that is called trade um, territories and states. So the idea of that at the moment Whenever you take a piece of land that you don't already have to core, uh, have a core on, you have to core that land. You have to spend the admin points to make that land legitimately part of your territory, to get the full benefits from it. But the problem you have is there are some territories that are considered to be distant overseas. Now, if you take a distant overseas territory and you core it, it will still have an autonomy flaw of 75% which means you're paying the full amount of admin points, you're paying a full coring cost to take a province and you're only going to get 25% of the value from its development. So what they've added now is this system that is called territories and states. When you take a um, province that is in a different region, so let's go and have a look at, we don't have the region map on here, but let's say for example... We're playing as somebody in Europe, say France, for example, and we take something down here maybe in Egypt because Egypt is a region. So we would take some land in Egypt. Now, that land is going to be distant overseas. It's going to have a 75% um, autonomy floor. Now, if we wanted to core that, it would cost us the full amount of admin points to core and we'd still only get 25% of what it was worth because of the 75% autonomy floor. But in Moray Nostrum, it would actually count as being part of a territory because it's in a different region and it's distant overseas. Now, when you have a province that's in a territory, you don't have to get a full core on it. You don't have to get a state core. You can get what is called a territorial core. Now, a ter territorial core is only half the cost of a full core. So basically, anything you take that's distant overseas, you get half price cores, which is certainly much better. 
Now, if you're just taking the odd little province here and there, maybe because you want the stepping stone to go and, I don't know, work your way around here and fabricate on the Ottomans or whatever, then that's fine. You can probably just leave it as a territory with a half core. But what happens if you take all of this land? What happens if you take a huge chunk of land all in one region and you think, I'd actually like to be making more from this land. I'd actually like to get the full amount of manpower and tax and everything. Well, what you can actually do is you can take a territory and you can turn it into a state. Now, every territory that you turn into a state, you have to pay a certain amount of maintenance towards it each month. However, when you turn a territory into a state, instantly all of the autonomy floor drops from 75% down to 50% 50, uh, 50%. so even though you're paying some maintenance towards it you've instantly gained an extra 25% of the um, development from that territory now it is a state also once you upgrade a territory to a state you can go around to all of those territorial cores and upgrade them to state cores now it costs you the full amount of admin points but you pay half again essentially to make it up to a full core but the process is done instantly. And as soon as you make it a full core, a state core, then it goes down to 0% autonomy. So it's a really good way to be able to take distant overseas provinces and actually have 0% autonomy. So the trade-off is you pay a little bit of money in maintenance and you gain 0% autonomy distant overseas provinces. However, if you're just taking little bits of land and you're not bothered about them, then you don't have to pay any maintenance for them. Just leave it as a territory and pay half price coring costs. I think that is a really good change and that is one that I am looking forward to. Another thing they are adding is a system called... Um, corruption and I'm a little bit unsure on corruption even paradox are at the moment because they're still kind of messing around with the way it works corruption basically starts at zero percent you can't have negative corruption but you go from zero percent corruption and you can go up to a hundred percent corruption if you're at zero percent corruption which is what you ideally want to be at then you won't get any negative effects and in fact you'll get a few bonuses and benefits if you start to gain corruption in your country, then things will start to get more expensive, you're likely to get more rebellions, um, you'll get hits to your diplomatic reputation with other nations, and there'll also be a series of bad events that can happen. Now, one of the main factors that will affect this uh, corruption is the new espionage system and this is mostly what Mare Nostrum is going to be about is they're overhauling the espionage system completely. Espionage has been in the game for a long time but it's one of those things that people generally tend to no uh, ignore especially in the uh, single player game. It has a little bit more utility in multiplayer but in single player espionage ideas generally tend to be a complete waste of time. So what they're doing is they are redoing the whole espionage system and that will allow you to have more of an impact on this corruption uh, mechanic. You can also pay a certain amount of money each month so you're going to have another slider in the economy panel and that will allow you to put aside so much money each month to uh, weed out the corruption and reduce the corruption within your nation. So the main change to the espionage system, and this is probably the biggest change so far that is going to be in Mare Nostrum, and I don't know whether it'll be part of the paid DLC or whether it will be part of the free patch, but it's certainly going to be one of the most interesting changes. And that is a change to the way that you fabricate claims. So at the moment, if you want to take land from somebody else, you go to a neighbour, you send a diplomat to one of their provinces who will spend a certain amount of time fabricating a claim and if you get caught it basically quadruples the length of time that it takes to get that claim if you then cancel it resets the progress to zero and you have to start again now the other downside with that is it ties up your diplomat while they're fabricating the claim and if you want to fabricate another claim you've got to wait for him to come home send him out again because you can only fabricate one claim at a time against each country so what's going to happen now is you no longer fabricate claims with your diplomats. What you do is you send your diplomat to another country and you get them to start establishing a spy network. Now establishing a spy network works pretty much the same way that fabricating a, fabricating a claim did in that the longer the diplomat is there, the more spy network points you can accumulate. So you start at zero and I believe the cap at the moment is 100. So it's like a percentage, you go from one, one to 100. And the longer that you are there fabric uh, 
the longer that you are there establishing this spy network, the more of these spy network points you accumulate. What you can then do is once you have 10 spy network points with a certain country, you can spend those 10 points and instantly fabricate a claim on one of their provinces. Now, this is really good because what this means is if you have... 60 spy points with a country you can fabricate six claims instantly and that means first of all you're not going to have all of your claims expiring at different times because you had to fabricate them one after another it also means that you can sort of almost ninja attack another nation you can quickly go Here, here's six claims declare war as opposed to what you'd have to do before which is fabricate one claim get a negative penalty with that country which you'd have to sit with while you were fabricating the rest of your claims so i actually quite like that idea one downside to that though is if you actually get caught creating a spy network then you get blocked from establishing a spy network with that country again for another five years so it does mean there's much more of a reason now to actually use counter espionage to try and catch other people spying on you and stop them from spying on you now if you do get caught um building your spy network and you and you are stopped from spying on that country for five years you can still use any spy network points you've already accumulated with them to fabricate claims which is still a nice touch Building up spy networks will have other uses as well, so the more spy influence you get against other nations, it will help you with doing things like um, agitating for liberty, uh, trying to support rebels and things like that, but also reducing aggressive expansion. If you've got a diplomat in another nation and you are establishing a spy network there, you can actually sort of bribe them almost under the table to turn a blind eye towards any aggressive expansion you may be performing so that is another nice thing with the system now when i first heard about this i was a little bit skeptical because i thought oh wow this is a really major change to one of the most core concepts of eu4 and i really don't know if i like it but thinking about the changes i actually think they will play a better part the new fabrication system means you'll be able to fabricate more quickly against certain nations and I do actually quite like that. Another thing that I thought about recently, which is a really good idea, is currently the way it works. If you have a diplomat who is currently fabricating a claim, and let's say all of your diplomats are busy doing something, you're all fabricating claims, your claims are all up to 80%, and maybe you're in a war and you need to, you need to peace out. You can't peace out because all of your diplomats are fabricating claims. So you've got two choices. You can either wait until they've finished, which might take a while, or you can bring one of your diplomats back. Now, the problem is, if you bring a diplomat back while they're fabricating a claim, then that progress is lost and you've got to start again. That isn't going to be the case with the spy network, because if you are establishing a spy network with a nation and you bring that diplomat back, you don't instantly lose all of those spy network points you've accumulated. They do start to tick down over time if you don't actually have a diplomat there working on the spy network, but it does mean that if you are working on a spy network in another country, you can pull a diplomat back, use him for something else, send him back to that country and re-establish the spy network, and you probably won't have lost all that many points in between. So. I actually think that is going to be a good change. Overall, I think it will take a little bit of getting used to, especially for people who have played EU4 from the very beginning. Of course, it is another level of complexity that people are going to have to learn and adjust to. But I think overall, it is actually going to make the game better and a little bit more interesting. It's one of those mechanics that... We don't really like to see change because it's been around since the start of the game, but it is one of those mechanics that probably did need the change simply because it hasn't really kept up with the pace of development for the rest of the game. Well, I hope this video has been useful to some of you, giving you a bit more of an idea about what you can expect in the Mare Nostrum DLC. Like I said, when I get access to it, I will make proper videos, um, tutorials that do actually explain and demonstrate the way that the changes work, and hopefully by then everything will be locked down in terms of what exactly the pros and cons are of each of these mechanical changes. So, thanks a lot for watching, guys. I've been Unstable Voltage. I'll see you on the next video. Until then, goodbye for now.